Well, our text tonight is in Esther chapter 2 in verses 8 through 20. If you turn there in your Bibles, Esther chapter 2 in verses 8 to 20. I've titled our message tonight, A Rodeo of Royal Repugnancy. A Rodeo of Royal Repugnancy. And there are, in our theme tonight, there are three stages of a demeaning process that set a divine stage. Three stages of a demeaning process that set a divine stage. Now, last week we saw the beginning of King Ahasuerus's pursuit of a new queen. And with it, the proposal to gather all the beautiful young girls into the king's harem. And we noted the parallel of human trafficking in our world today. That although we find a a book before us that is thousands of years old, the same atrocities that are represented go on in our world. We examined the processes of this selection and we noted the, the moral repugnancy of it. And we will, unfortunately, see more of that tonight. In fact, in verses 5 and 6, we connected Mordecai, Esther's uncle and the one caring for her to the exiles from Jerusalem. And this was, I know, a bit academic. And so I just want to pause for a minute. And if you felt like last week you got hit with a Gatling gun, I apologize. Sometimes, as I was talking with a couple of the gals earlier, when I read through the commentaries and I find that there are specific sections of texts where liberals or others who attack the scripture and say that for some reason these texts show or that there's no support for it, I tend to go overboard in elaborating and trying to confirm how clear the scripture itself shows the reality of its foundation. And I did that a little bit last week as I got kind of engaged talking about the last three kings of Judah and their connection to Jeconiah that is indicated there in verse 6 and how Mordecai related to that. So again, my apologies if it was a little bit academic. We'll find that that I'll I'll try to take note of that and uh, minimize or at least make that more clear. But I hope that it it was of some value for you and that you did recognize the connectivity of this important text to God's word. And we'll see so much more of that this evening. But it was, again, important because of the time elements. And what we find in one of the commentators I looked at this week was, again, addressing the statement I made before we began Esther. And that is that without some of these details, there are elements in Esther that we would have no idea of from anywhere else in Scripture were they not connected here. So they're important from that perspective as well. Then in verse 7, we were introduced to Esther, or Hadassah, which is the Hebrew translation of her Persian name. Her Persian name was Ishtar, which we talked about being the goddess of love and beauty. And it's interesting that this name Hadassah is still a very prominent name today. The largest organization of Jewish women in the world is called Hadassah. And they support the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. And it is one of the largest hospitals caring for particularly the needs of women and children, but for all people. And it bears the name of Esther, Hadassah. Well, our text reflects tonight this selection of a queen. But in many ways, it more closely relates to the treatment of rodeo stock. And yet amidst this, it's God's divine plan. Now, let me just state so there's no question that I am a fan of rodeo. Uh, I was born in southwestern Montana. I've been going to rodeos since probably they could take me out of the house. Uh, I, as, as a young boy, I rode in the Tiny Tyke Rodeo in Dillon. Um, I love my cowboy boots, and I am very much a supporter of that. So please don't get any wrong ideas about that. But people, especially beautiful women, but all people ought to be treated with the greatest respect and not like animals. And in many ways, our text tonight 
looks more closely like a rodeo event than it does the treatment of women. Let's take a look at it and read it. We'll make some comments. Esther chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Haggai that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Haggai who was in charge of the women. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him. So he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food, gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace, and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Every day, Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. Now, in the turn of each young lady came to go into King Ahasuerus after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and the cosmetics for women. The young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem, to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not again go into the king unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. Now, in the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go into the king. She did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. The roundup, the royal, excuse me, the rodeo of royal repugnancy. The Rodeo of Royal Repugnancy. Our first point, the beginning of verse 8, I've titled The Roundup and the Training. The Roundup and Training. Now, in the early days of rodeo, particularly in this part of the world, there was a roundup that happened for the wild Mustangs, many of which were just south of us in northern Nevada, and they were brought in, they were corralled, and then they were to some degree trained so that there was at least a chance of putting a rider on the back of them. And these became the bucking stock for the rodeo. So they were rounded up and they were trained so as to prepare them. Well, you might ask, well, how does that connect to this? I mean, is that just some fanciful uh, pastor's confusion about what this text represents? Well, I wish it were. But unfortunately, it is much too close to reality. Verse 8 looks like this roundup. Many young ladies are gathered to the capital, that is, the citadel at Susa. The temple, which was in Susa, the capital of Persia at that time, which we've talked about. Josephus tells us that there were as many as 400 young virgins that were gathered together for this roundup. Now that's staggering, is it not? to consider that kind of abomination. And yet let's not be totally surprised as if it's these pagan Persians for we also are reminded of the wisest king ever in the world, King Solomon, who had 300 wives and 700 concubines. 
as we're told of in 1 Kings 11.3. And then the verse after that, 1 Kings 11.4, we're told that those women turned the king's heart away from God. God has made the relationship between man and woman to be between one man and one woman. We see all sorts of examples that are contrary to that in Scripture. That does not mean those are God's plan. It is not appropriate today that some in the religious world believe polygamy is an acceptable relationship between a man and many wives. That is not God's calling, and this is not the way things are to occur. And notice here in verse 8 that they're given to the charge of Haggai. He is not one of the seven eunuchs back from chapter 1 and verse 10. So this is another individual that's brought forward for us. But look carefully at the description of Esther in verse 8. In the middle of the verse, the young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Haggai. Why the repetition? What happens when we see repetition in our Bibles? It's there for our attention, isn't it? There's something that we're supposed to note. So note it. Note that there's something here that you want to pay attention to. We'll see exactly what it is as we move ahead. But Haggai is the keeper of the women. Esther found favor with Haggai in verse 9. And this is a very important concept that we're going to see throughout this chapter. That word there, favor. It is the word that is often translated in the New Testament form as grace. So she found favor with Haggai. Important for us to understand this. Why? Because there are many, these are the most beautiful women from this massive region stretching from the drainage of the Indus River, which is in India and Pakistan, all the way around through the Middle East, encompassing all of the Middle East and down into Northern Africa. And Esther finds favor amongst them. So we need to note this. Literally, the Hebrew text says, the girl was good in his eyes, and she raised favor before his face. Haggai treated her well, as we see there in verse 9. He quickly gave her cosmetics and food, and then gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace, that is, from the king's house. That will become important as well as we get further along into our text, that origin of these seven maids from the king's house. So she was well treated by Haggai. And verses 10 and 11 then become a parenthesis. That is, we've been given this introductory information and now we're going to get these two verses that are just brought in to give us some additional insight. Verse 10 says, Esther did not make known her people or her kindred. For Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. And when we see this, we have to wonder, well, what's going on here? Is this a problem? Why is Esther doing this? Is Esther ignoring who she is? Is this a rejection of God? We know that there is no direct reference to God in the book, but is this us seeing the, the headline of this book as one who is rejecting her origin and rejecting the God who is her beginning? Well, that could be the situation, but it could also be for protection of her that Mordecai instructed her for this. It could be because of future opportunities for her to help her people because we've read ahead and we understand what will result. But it's interesting that at this time, and if you go back and you look at your timelines, you'll notice that very shortly after this period in Esther's life, we find that the walls of Jerusalem are destroyed for the second time. Remember, Back in 586, with the third captivity, Jerusalem is destroyed. The 70-year captivity had already begun, and in 536, the, the temple and the walls are rebuilt. But there has been much 
antagonism from those around Jerusalem against the exiles that have now returned. And they are fighting them. And we see this in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. The focus on Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls. Because as they began that wall construction, they were, it was being torn down. And the walls are again torn down. So perhaps Mordecai understood the antagonism from around the kingdom towards the Jews. And therein he kept Esther from proclaiming her truth. Now we can't be dogmatic about this. We don't know that. But we do see in Ezra 4, 23, the destruction of the walls. And we notice that the time frame fits very closely. Again, about 30 years from when this event occurred. And we notice that there is this entire return of the exiles, which has now been going on for about 50 years. And during that period, as they're rebuilding, there's continual antagonism. So this may well be what was going on. Then in verse 11, we see another element of the parenthesis where it says, Every day Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. We might read that and say, well, that seems perfectly normal. His daughter, whom he's taken to himself, his niece actually, but she, he has adopted her and he's cared for her. Of course, he would go look, but recognize the fact that this is not a place where men just get to go. We've spoken much about the eunuchs and what they went through to allow themselves to be those who care for the harem. You just didn't go show up at the harem. So as Mordecai is daily walking back and forth before the court of the harem, it tells us something about Mordecai. Throughout the book of Esther, we get these glimpses. These little pictures that are going to show us so much more as we move ahead. This is one of those little pictures. We need to ask ourselves, how does he get here? Of course he would want to, but wouldn't all of the fathers of these 400 women want to go and see what's going on? Of course they would. But somehow Mordecai is granted access. One of the commentaries that I read talked so beautifully about how Mordecai's caring for Esther is exactly like a parent caring for their grown children. Of course, with grown children, Karen, I understand this well, and many of you with grown children, even grandchildren, also can relate. We no longer have the control over our children that we once did or that we wish we did. But it doesn't mean that we give up the ship it doesn't mean that we say, well, they're adults now, nothing I can do about it. No, absolutely not. When was the last time you that have grown children or grandchildren called your kids to ask them about how things are going at their church? Can I encourage you as you're taking your prayer list, find out the name of your kid's pastor and pray for him. Pray for him. And make sure that your kids know the name of their pastor if you know what I'm saying. Well, Mordecai was caring for her, and it goes the same for grandparents. Don't assume that, well, you know, now I get all of the fun of being a grandparent, and I get to feed them ice cream and Coke and send them back home. That's a great concept. Parents probably are not as excited about it as you are. But the reality is there are very few that can have the spiritual impact and effect, and it means Beloved, you have to take a corrective role at times in the lives of your grandkids. They need it. They need that correction. They need that direction. They may not be listening to their parents. Their parents may not be giving them the direction that they should. Don't allow yourselves to simply vacate your relationship with your grown children and or grandchildren. Mordecai didn't. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us this, doesn't it? Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he was old, he will not depart from it. We don't know how long that's going to be, but God's promises are sure. The word of the Lord does not return void. Continue to bring the word of the Lord to your kids. Continue to trust that God's going to work through them. They may go through mess after mess after mess. They may look like there is no hope of them finding Christ. Do not give up. Never give up. Never stop encouraging. Never stop being that force and that voice for Christ. Christ. 
Well, as we look through this first parenthesis and our first point, the roundup in the training, this takes us to verse 12 and our second point for tonight, which I've titled the arena and the back pens. The arena and the back pens. If you're familiar with rodeo, and if you're not, you need to be. You know, I got to tell you, I was so excited to get back to Idaho. And then when I found out that they canceled the Caldwell Night Rodeo, I was like, oh. And they canceled the Snake River Stampede too. Oh, really? Well, I've got Haley. I got the Days of the Old West Rodeo. <laughs> oh, for three. Well, what happens in a rodeo? Usually the bucking events are some of the first part of the rodeo. They're some of the more exciting part, short of the bull riding, which they put at the end. But these animals are brought out of the front pens where they've all, they're all numbered and they've had their numbers drawn and it's been assigned and matched to a cowboy. So then those animals are brought into the bucking chutes and of course the cowboys have been assigned to each of these animals. They come out of the bucking, shoots into the arena where they ride them for a score. I could go into the particulars, but I'll get way too sideways. So after the ride is over, then the animals are ushered back into the back pens. No longer cared about their particulars. They're just prepared either for another night of rodeo or to go onto the truck and onto another location. Well, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the arena, the event, and then the back pens. Verse 12 shows us this very thing where it says, Now when the turn of each young lady came to go into King Ahasuerus after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and with cosmetics for women. We saw a parenthesis in verses 10 and 11 This is a second parenthesis in verses 12 to 14. It gives us more information, a little highlight, a little blurb, if you will, about what's going on in the preparation to go before the king. We're told here that they have 12 months of preparation and that that includes six months of treatment with the oil of myrrh. And according to commentators, that is a time where myrrh, which was a very expensive spice, was mixed with olive oil. And as it was put onto the skin, it opened the pores of the skin and it made the skin extremely supple. These are already young women. And they're putting this oil that is adding to the softness of their skin for six months. And after that, then they are given six months of this treatment with cosmetics and spices. The literal translation of this is actually that they are brought before incense of spices for six months. They literally are brought before the burning of spices, if we look at the literal translation of the Hebrew, which also is supported by archaeological finds from the city of Susa, from what they believe is the court of the women. So these women, after this six-month treatment, were basically bathed in incense and smoke so that their skin absorbed the smell of these burning spices. And this is the process by which they are prepared to go before the king for this full year. Then verse 13 gives us a bit more of the insight where it tells us the young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. So this is like going into Tiffany and being given carte blanche to pick up anything you want to put on and to take into the king. Necklaces, jewelry, earrings, gold, crowns, whatever it might be, you can take whatever you want. And you can go into the finest department store and find whatever costumes and whatever wear that you might want to take into the king. Because the goal is to win the king's favor when it's your time in the arena. Verse 14 gives us the end of the parenthesis where it says, in the evening she would go in and in the morning she would return to the second harem, to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go in, not again go into the king unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. The rodeo of royal repugnancy is in full view at this point in verse 14. 
You know, my grandmother used to say of scantily and inappropriately dressed women, they just need, leave nothing to the imagination, she would say. In other words, there's no sense of intrigue. Well, there's nothing left to the imagination in verse 14. They go in in the evening and they come out in the morning. And I think we pretty much all get a picture of what's going on here. And it is indeed a deplorable scenario. And in case there's any questions, the middle of the verse confirms this, where it says that she would return to the second harem, to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. No longer Haggai, Haggai who was placed twice before us for emphasis, this man who comes out of nowhere and finds two mentions both in one verse, now is changed. And the reason he's changed is because the women are going to a different place. They are no longer going back to the place that they were, the house of the harem. They're now going to the second house, to the house of the concubines. They're going to be locked up because they're not allowed to return to their family after this immoral horror, but they're rather kept in bondage and not allowed to see the king again unless he decides to call them by name. A rodeo of royal repugnancy. First the roundup and training, and then the arena and the back pens, the back pens where these women have been shuffled off to. And these two parentheses that we've seen, verses 10 and 11, and then verses 12 through 14. And now, our third point, the crowning of a champion. The crowning of a champion. Verse 15 carries us to this point where it says, Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go into the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Esther takes nothing but what Haggai had suggested. And the reason is, at the end of the verse, because she found favor with all. We saw that she had found favor back in verse 9 with Haggai, but Esther had found favor with everyone. Esther was one of those women that was internally beautiful and externally stunning. She just was a head turner. An absolutely gorgeous woman. And Esther was a woman who exemplified, as I mentioned, not only this external beauty, but an internal beauty. Can I share with you one of my favorite verses from the New Testament or two verses that talk about this from 1 Peter chapter 3? Ladies, I just want to uh, encourage you regarding these verses. I think they are some of the most stunning in the Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3 and 3. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. Esther didn't take fancy adornment and, and wild costumes and clothes in because all recognized her beauty was evident to all around her. Ladies, may this be the case for you too. This is what speaks to men. Not, not dressing inappropriately, not wearing a, as scantily a clothing as you can possibly get away with without frostbite in the middle of winter. No. No but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality that is precious in the sight of God. Ladies, understand that that quality, that godly quality with, which is within you, it is impossible for any man to refuse because that is true beauty. It is that which is precious in the sight of God. That is the character that Esther exuded. And that was the reason that she need carry none of these fanciful things with her. 
And in verse 16, it's Esther's turn. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tabeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Notice the timing. Back in chapter 1 in verse 3, where were we? We were in the third year. Look again at your timelines. We're in the third year of the king's reign. Now we are in the seventh year. Four full years have elapsed. What happened? How can that be? What? That doesn't make any sense. Again, those that would attack the scripture and tell us, see, this is clearly an error and a contradiction completely miss the reality of the timeline. And at the bottom of your timeline, it shows us exactly what was going on. We see in 483, where we saw the military planning session, the 180-day feast that went on in chapter 1. And throughout this, we are finding ourselves about three-quarters of the way through the king's collecting of his army. Vashti is demoted at the end of that. And then we see in the middle of 481, the expedition begins. Remember, Xerxes is trying to get revenge on Greece for crushing his father and his army. So he takes a revived military, both army and navy, and goes after the Greeks. By the way, he also suffers a humiliating loss. But this battle goes on for three years. Look at it there. The expedition begins about the spring of 481. Recognize that this three-year battle that went on was different than the way wars are fought today. Wars in the ancient world happened, they began in the spring and they went until the beginning of winter. Armies couldn't sustain the winters. They did not have proper protection or clothing and they couldn't move forward because of their armaments. The chariots would simply sink in the mud of the rains and the winter time. So the war went on beginning in the spring of 481 to the late fall. Then there was a break where they would begin again in 480 and continue on. Notice this is where Esther is finally brought to Susa at the end of 480, the beginning of 479, December to January of that period. The third year of the war goes on in 479, and we see Xerxes return to Susa at the end of 479 in the fall after the third year of battle. Four years have gone on since the beginning of this military planning to today, and Esther is finally made queen in the seventh year and the tenth month. In verse 17, Esther is crowned as the champion. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set his royal crowner on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. We note again the favor that Esther received. In verse 9, she received favor from Haggai, the king's eunuch. We see at the end of verse 15 that she received favor from the eyes of all who saw her. And now she receives favor from the king. She receives grace from the king, but she receives more. Notice it, it says she also received kindness. That is a word that we are very familiar with from our study of Ruth, that Hebrew word hesed. Steadfast love, loyal love. The king truly loved Esther. He was smitten with her. The crown that she receives is the high turban which belonged to Vashti. It is the exact same Hebrew word we saw back in chapter 1 in verse 11. And we remember that the reason that the Persians wore crowns on top of turbans is because there were many lower kings of their area and they would wear a crown on their head. But only the high king could wear his turban with the crown up on it so that it was elevated above the head and elevated above all others who might wear a crown or a tiara on their head. So this was the high turban that was placed on Esther's head and thus she becomes the new queen. And in verse 18, a great celebration ensued. Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet. For all his princes and his servants, he also made a holiday, 
for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. This great banquet for F Esther and he gives gifts to the attendees and declares a holiday. This holiday is most likely that which was a release of the men from their military service. That was a significant thing in the ancient world. Because unless you were a prince or a royal, you were one who was in the army. And that was a lifetime commitment, whatever and however long that might be for. So this holiday was a significant granting by the king. But there's more than that. It says that he gave gifts. And if we looked at a literal translation of that phrase to give gifts, it means to the remission of taxes. So there was an exemption of military service, and then there was also this remission of taxes. And in fact, if you look at the English Standard Version, it uses that very phrase. What an incredible situation that was. This is how the king made his money. He basically taxed everyone. Again, we return back to Solomon. Do you remember when Solomon died and his son Rehoboam came to reign after him? And the people all came to him and said, hey, your father was a little harsh. If you'll deal kindly with us, we will serve you. And what did Rehoboam say? <sighs> yeah, my father was nothing. He whipped you with whips. I will whip you with scorpions. My little finger is thicker than my father's loin, which is an incredible statement. But nonetheless, what we see here is that this remission of taxes and this exemption from military service is, and it shows the, what's going on in the king's heart. He's like, there's never been anything like this in my life. This from a man who has obviously a massive harem as he's just brought as many as 400 new people into it. Verse 19 gives us some of the very unique details of this where it says, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate. Two important features exist here. But what are they and what do they mean? The king's harem is gathered for the second time. What's the, and these are the virgins that are gathered for the second time. What does this mean? Well, it means simply that the king was so smitten with Esther, there's not going to be any longer the, this, this beauty competition. It's over. It's over. Esther wins. The rest of the virgins will remain in the harem. Now, unfortunately, they don't get to go back home, but they are not continuing on with this process of, entering and leaving and then departing to the second harem and to be put into the house of the concubines. Ahasuerus' selection of Esther has been made. This is still despicable and a repugnant situation. By the way, this is such a, a strong commentary on our day. Intimate, interpersonal relations before marriage are unconscionable. And to say so in 2021 is ludicrous to 99% of our country. Many in our churches would say that relations before marriage, interpersonal, intimate relations before marriage are necessary so that the couple gets to know one another. And there's no big deal if that goes on before marriage. And we shouldn't get all uptight about that. Well, the reality that is absolutely contrary to the truths of Scripture. Because, beloved, this is either fornication or it is adultery. Or a more abhorrent form if it is not between a man and a woman. And the Scripture calls this out clearly. And yet this is our world. This is what we live in today. To even suggest that there should not be Premarital intimacy is an absurdity to many in our world. We need to recognize this. We need to call it what it is. And it's, and it's not like it's a big secret, is it? Any of you hear of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette? 
Is this King Ahasuerus? Let's just line up a bunch of pretty girls and go see what happens. Well, that's a very morally appropriate consideration. And this is some of the most popular TV in our country. What a commentary on the reality of moral depravity and repugnancy that is here in our land today. So this second gathering are those of the 400 who had not been with the king. And further, it expresses Esther's beauty. And we see the same thing today when we think of the the Miss America or the Miss Universe pageant. One lady, after all of these processes, whatever they represent, is brought forward and she is crowned as Miss America or Miss Universe. Do they bring her out by herself? Nope. They bring her out with the whole crew of them because it's like this one is standing out amongst all of these beauties. That's exactly what's happening here. Esther is brought before this parade of the second harem, all of these beautiful women. And the king is like, these women are beautiful, but this one, she exceeds them all. The second thing we see about verse 19 is that Mordecai is sitting in the gate. Again, we go, okay, it's over. Mordecai can't do much about it, so he's just hanging out in the gate, kind of feeling sorry for himself. Well, remember from Ruth chapter 4 what happens in the city gates. This is where the leaders of the city meet, remember? Boaz went and he saw the closer relative and then he gathered the elders of the city who were also there so that they could conduct legal transactions. The leaders of the city are who sit in the city gate. You'd say, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that Mordecai had any part of that. But that is exactly what happens. Absalom used to sit in the city gate to usurp King David's authority. We see that in 2 Samuel 15 too. Daniel used to sit in the city gate in Daniel 2 in verses 48 and 49. But not only was it an important location, but it gives us a hint as to what's coming next. Here's another little glimpse, beloved. Don't miss it. It's another little glimpse about Mordecai sitting in the city gate. We understand so much about what's happening here as we come to the end of this section of our text. We've seen Haggai used two times in verse 8, and he's contrasted with Shaskaz, who is the concubine eunuch. We've seen seven maids from the king's house in verse 9 to the house of the kings where the concubines went in verse 13. We've seen Mordecai's place in the gate, very important. And if you've read ahead into verse 21 and following, you'll see and we'll come back to that next week. But it also shows his status. And we say, well, how do we know that? Well, because there are ancient extra biblical manuscripts called the cuneiform texts and they reference a man by the name of Marduka and we know that Mordecai's Persian name is Marduka. They reference a prince of Xerxes who reigned in Susa and we know that that's coming later, don't we? Well, here's the hitch. The cuneiform tablets tell us that Marduka's reign in Susa occurred before the book of Esther, back around 485 at the beginning of Xerxes' reign. Mordecai is in the gate, beloved, because he is already reigning. He is already a man of importance. This may give us a hint as to why he also did not tell us more about Esther. His status tells us much about this. And this is also the status that allowed him to go before the court of the harem. Otherwise, he would not be allowed there, but he already had a hierarchy. And then verse 20 becomes our rodeo's last whistle and prelude of what's coming. 
where it says, Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. The question that comes up, there are a couple here, but the first is, is there a time when we ought not speak? You know, the story is told of a young couple that moved to Pittsburgh who knew no one and who lived there for a time and they met another couple as their children were of similar age that lived down the block. The couple that they met were Christians and they went to this new couple and they asked them if they'd want to go to church and they said, absolutely not. And they let it go and they went on. Well, sometime shortly thereafter, this new couple's youngest child got extremely sick and was hospitalized for an extended period. The mother was constantly in the hospital with the child, as we would expect. The other mother is there. She has taken the older child into their home and is caring for them. She's bringing meals to the home for the husband. She is watching out and visiting the hospital to help this woman who's with her daughter. And after some time, the new woman in the neighborhood says, why are you doing this? And she says, after this elapsed period of time, I have Jesus Christ in my heart and it's what I live to do. And it's my joy to serve your family. They went on to talk about how this new family had some really bad church experiences, and we all know how those can go. But as they talked to this solid Christian couple, they overcame those poor issues in churches before, and they became solid members of a believing body. Is there a time not to speak? Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 7, there is a time to remain silent and a time to speak. There will soon come a time for Esther to speak, but not now. Esther has held her breath to this point regarding what Mordecai had told her to do. Does it mean that she was rejecting the God whom she represented from her people? Does it mean that this was a rejection of Jewish nationalism? Those that are the most fiercely defensive of their position as a nation and have been since the beginning of time? Maybe not. Maybe not. We need to wait and see how the rest of the story plays out. Well, this is indeed a rodeo of royal repugnancy. It makes us sick to our gut to consider what was going on. And It helps us to realize the vital nature of proper relationships between men and women. Also, it brings questions uh, about hiding who we are, but also lessons about not judging too quickly. God's going to show us some amazing things because his sovereign hand has set the stage for these two individuals, Esther and Mordecai, to carry forth in the most incredible circumstances to be imagined. And we start to understand more as we get a picture of all that's unraveling before us. So next week, we'll dive more fully into that as we dive into the next section. Pray with me, won't you? Father, thank you for an understanding of what might be going on here. Thank you, Father, for a clear gut check on the reality of what we know was going on here and what we know is going on in our world. Lord, may we never be those who acquiesce. May we not become the frog thrown into the warm water that as the temperature of immorality is heated up and it comes to a boil, we are boiled in the very filth that we live around but may we continue to stand for truth. May we continue to be those that speak the truth of your word and the power of Christ and the necessity of salvation in him and him alone. Lord, thank you that there are such parallels to the church today in this book and such wonderful truths for us to recognize. Help us not to be those who draw conclusions quickly and bring to the truth of your word, our presuppositions, and help us not do that in the world around us. 
Help us to leave you room to work. Help us to, in love, speak to those who we know are in darkness and who are underneath the entrapment of the enemy. May we not be those who judge the world around us, for Scripture tells us that is not our role. But we are to love them and we are to present them with the truth of the gospel. And Lord, thank you that we see so clearly the need for that as the atrocities and the repugnancy of this chapter are that which we live in every day. We praise you for your love and goodness, Lord, and we just ask that you would guide us to our home safely, help us to ponder these amazing truths, and Father, bring us back together again so that we can marvel more at you and your amazing word. We love you, and we pray this all in Christ's holy name. Amen. God bless you.